All right, so thank you everyone for coming along to this um, this workshop, uh, this briefing session, I suppose, on the Geelong Strate Strategic Assessment. My name is Adrian Marshall. I'm the facilitator of the Grassy Plains Network. Um, now, oh, look at that. Could use my mouse. Um, I'm the facilitator of the Grassy Plains Network, and with the VNPA and a number of other Geelong-based um, community nature organisations, we together are the Northwest Alliance, and we have concerns about the protection of nature that is um, being um, proposed under the Geelong Strategic Assessment. Uh, before I go. Any further, I like to uh, say that I'm um, talking to you from Wurundjeri land, but the the land of the Geelong Strategic Assessment is Wadarong land, and I would like to extend my respects to the elders of both the Wurundjeri and the Wadarong, um, um, past and uh, past past present and emerging, and pay also my respects to any other First Nations people that are here today. Um, and I would also like to say that uh, the First Nations people have successfully looked after our beautiful national heritage, as it were, of our grasslands and the ecosystems uh, around where we live for millennia. And in a brief couple of hundred years, we have managed to do great harm to those ecosystems and the Geelong Strategic Assessment is an ongoing example of that. So um, we're going to, I'm going to present for a little while uh, give on the background of the Geelong Strategic Assessment. It is not going to be Dr. Megan O'Shea speaking about, sorry, this is the wrong the wrong slide. It is Dr. David De Angelis from La Trobe University um, who will be speaking to you about ground and grass frogs. Um, we'll have um, a little bit of a question and answer after David's finished his presentation, and then we'll go and have some talk about how to write a good submission and just some more discussion as we uh, as as things pan out. So, to the Geelong Strategic Assessment. Uh, well, sorry, other ground rules, I suppose. Please um, mute if you if you can uh, and put your questions. Well, we can put questions in the chat if you want, but I'm quite happy for you just to to speak up as well. We'll see how how things go. I guess um, I'll just try and keep an eye on the the, the chat as well. So, um, right. So the Geelong Strategic Assessment affects the northern and western growth areas of Geelong. They're these two areas you can see on your screen. So if we, uh, it's a land, mostly farming landscape, grazing and cropping with the Moorable River there. Uh, it's large, 7,000 hectares. It's going to provide for over 100,000 people. And the purpose of the Geelong Strategic Assessment is very specific. It is uh, to look after um, those natural values that are protected under the federal EPBC Act, the, the federal nature laws. So uh, there are a number of species that that pertains to, um, creatures like the ground and grass frog, and I'll take you through that in a little bit. So the Geelong Strategic Assessment is an agreement between the city of Greater Geelong and the federal government, no state government um, in the picture, in that agreement, and uh, to work out how those environmental values will be protected or not. Uh, the developer is going to be charged a levy, and that levy is going to pay for the conservation that happens in uh, the Geelong Strategic Assessment area. So natural values that are present. So there are quite a lot. Um, let's start with striped legless lizards. Okay, so sorry, just to orientate you a bit more if you need, we've got the ring road down here, the Murrable River through here, Cowies Creek. Um, yes, the Anarchy Road, whatever, Bacchus Marsh Road up there. Uh, so striped legless lizards, 
they're um, listed as vulnerable under federal and state legislation. There, there are four populations of those across the, the, the two growth areas. All of the striped legless lizards are in the northern section. So four populations there. There's a stack of golden sun moth in the northern area as well. These are, um, again, endangered species. Uh, there's, they occur, um, they're grassland specialists, so they occur in degraded grassland but and better quality grassland across that area. There is good quality grassland. So there's a patch of uh, kangaroo grass dominated uh, grassland here and some slightly less good grassland through here. There's also a little bit of good grassland down here as well that escaped my map. My apologies to everyone. And so two significant waterways, the mighty Cowies Creek and the even mightier Moorable River. And Cowies Creek has a population of growling grass frogs. So we've known for numerous years that they're on the bay side of the Ring Road, Princess Freeway, but the surveys for the Geelong Strategic Assessment have revealed that there's a good population on the other side, the inland side of the Ring Road up Cowies Creek as well. Now, the city of Geelong is proposing some strategic conservation areas. There's a language here that I have to introduce you to. Strategic conservation areas are the conservation areas that will be funded by the levy on developers, and their primary purpose is the protection of nature. Okay, so um, along here in this strategic conservation area here, it's for the protection of the growling grass frogs and so on. So there are four. There's one up here in the north that's protecting golden sun moth and striped legless lizard. There's one along Cowies Creek that's protecting growling grass frogs. There's a thin strip along the Murable River. And down off the screen, there's a similar one along the Barwon River. So even though I'm not showing you the Barwon River, it is in a very awkward and hard to explain way, part of this Geelong strategic assessment. And it's getting a um, conservation area along it as well. Uh, then there are opportunity areas. So the city of Geelong is proposing these opportunity areas. Opportunity areas are very badly named, but the idea is that there's a chance for conservation of nature, natural values in those areas, but that is not their sole or even primary purpose. So they might have drainage works there, they might have bike paths, they might have dog parks, they uh, might have sports fields for, for all I know. They are opportunity areas only. And the few, what happens in those opportunities will not be decided as part of the Geelong strategic assessment process. That will be decided further down the planning timeline at the precinct structure planning stage. So to explain what I mean by that, there are four precincts in this northern area and two here that will be rolled out over time. And the precinct in the precinct structure planning phase, the, uh, the planners say there will be a school here, the main road will be here, this is where your sports ovals will be, and so on. So it's still like a large scale uh, process, but it's a finer large scale process than the overarching Geelong strategic assessment. So uh, very briefly to explain the um, so bit talk a bit more about the natural values present, grasslands. So grasslands are critically endangered. There's very little of them left, like only 1%. And the quality of that, the good patches of that 1% is really small. So there's probably only 1% of 1% left in terms of good patches. They have been extensively cleared when uh, John Batman arrived. He saw grass all the way from the Yarra River to the South Australian border. We had a grass rush. A lot of people, well, a few people became very wealthy out in the Western District. 
but the 16 million sheep that ended up there within 16 years of John Batman's arrival ate everything, um, eroded things, compacted the soil, introduced weeds. Uh, the First Nations people were dispossessed, so we lost the traditional management, uh, traditional management processes. And then we added superphosphate to it. Native plants don't like super, uh, don't like phosphorus very much. And exotic weeds use the nitrogen in superphosphate better than the native plants do. So they suddenly start out competing the native plants. So all of that pretty much trashed our grasslands. And now we've got urban development on top of that. To give you an idea of what 1% means, this, so that's the urban growth boundary of Melbourne there in purple, Geelong here, Portland over there. This, all of that orange was grassland once upon a time, okay? Now, this is what we've got left. So a tiny little bit, absolutely, pretty much absolutely, none around Geelong, though there is a little bit, we know. Um, so very highly, highly fragmented and depleted ecosystem. And it's not just an ecosystem, it's home to a whole lot of um, creatures like striped legless lizards and growling grass frogs, but also a whole lot of threat or threatened uh, plant uh, plants as well. So striped legless lizards, these uh, came to Australia before uh, snakes were here. So they evolved to fill the snake's niche. They lost their legs uh, so that they could get under uh, rocks and down soil cracks and so on. They're tiny. They're only about, you know, 30 centimetres long. They're um, very hard to, to see. They make a little squeaking noise. They don't hiss. They don't have a forked tongue. They've got a normal tongue, and the area uh, between Geelong and Melbourne is pretty much a stronghold for them. Uh, they don't go travel very far either. They might spend their whole life within a dozen metres or so, so quite uh, constrained in, um, in their movement. Golden sun moth, uh, another amazing creature. It lives for several years underground, eating the, the roots of grass tussocks before emerging for a single day, usually, to fly poorly across the, the, the grassland, trying to see the little sparkle of a mate's wings somewhere between the tussocks so that it can mate and die. Uh, they're a grassland specialist, and uh, they're quite, yeah, quite a large moth, moth too. I'm not telling you about growling grass frogs because David is going to tell you about them shortly. Um, then we have the, the Murrubal River. Um, many of you will know that this is a very uh, long suffering river. The, the, it's had uh, two, two lots of works to, to straighten its course and so on. Um, it's the, uh, Bed, the, night, the stuff that was done in 1935, the concrete bed has cracked. It's losing a lot of water there that ends up in the quarry. Then the quarry pumps it out. That's the Batesford Quarry, sorry. And the quarry pumps it out further downstream. So we get a length of the Murrubal that actually can run dry. It's pretty, pretty tragic. But there are promises being made that those that repairs will be done, that it will flow properly. And when it does flow properly, we can expect to see endangered species like um, galaxias and barred galaxias moving upstream to, to populate its upper reaches like where, well, not upper reaches, but the reaches at the, um, in the Western uh, growth area. It's, uh, yeah, and it's got an extensive floodplain too. And you can see on this map, that's kind of the extent of its floodplain through there. So. Just back to this map, it's, um, this is what the city of Geelong is proposing. Uh, this is what uh, we're asking for, what the Northwest Alliance is asking for. And I'll take you through this um, one bit at a time. So these striped legless lizard populations, that uh, three of them are in opportunity areas. This, the striped legless lizards up here get a strategic conservation area. So they're safe, they're gonna be protected. They're going to be well protected and funded. That protection is going to be funded. But these guys through here, 
they're really, really vulnerable, okay? And it's, that's a real shame because, like, the Federal Threatened Species uh, Committee says that all populations of striped legless lizards, are the protection of them is necessary for the survival of the species. So it, it's pretty, pretty um, important to be protecting these. So what we want is these not to be opportunity areas, but to be strategic conservation areas. And then we want a little 50 meter buffer or so around them that can be used for passive recreation and so on, just to create a little bit more of space for those striped legless lizards to um, survive and hopefully thrive in the urban environment. Um, we want this patch up here to be expanded to include this, this parcel of land through here that's decent grassland and is home to uh, golden sun moth. That is really just because we think that the city of Geelong is setting the bar quite low in the extent of these um, good conservation areas that they are willing to protect. Uh, and it also provides space for expansion of those populations. Down along the Murrabal, we're not happy with a 50 metre buffer. We think a 200 metre buffer is, is far better. 200 metres is what people say is necessary, for instance, to uh, protect the growling grass frogs along Cowes Creek, which I'll tell you about in a sec. But um, that also seems reasonable along here. Uh, Cowie's Creek. So Cowie's Creek, we want, again, the buffer along the, the creek expanded. At the moment, it's only 100 metres, but the experts, and uh, David may speak to this, um, say 200 metres is uh, more like the sort of space that they need. So we want that that expanded. There's also this these wet patches through here. and. So I, I apologise, I haven't done my all my research as thoroughly as I should have yet. It's a rather busy week, but I suspect that there are growling grass frogs along here too that have not been surveyed for. And if there are, um, if those surveys haven't been done, then really these areas should be surveyed, and then the grass frogs, growling grass frogs that we will probably find, they should be protected as well. There's a language thing that um, bothers us, um, and that's um, it, it sets the bar very low. So, for in the population of striped legless lizards up here is um, the goal that is set for that space is for the population to persist, and that does not sound like a very positive um, or encouraging thing uh, to. We want them to expand, to thrive, to do all of that sort of stuff. If the population was reduced to a few dozen individuals, you might argue that that is the population persisting. So these, um, it's important to get the language right here. The other thing is interim management. Uh, so the acquisition of this conservation land is going to happen years from now, okay? City of Geelong says this parcel here will be acquired in five years, this parcel here in 14 years. Some of these other parcels might take even, even longer. And the thing is that bad things happen when land isn't managed for conservation. So in that intervening, intervening period, you might find that weeds are um, not being controlled, that feral animals are are taking over, um, that other destructive actions are taking place. So what we want is an interim management program that uh, basically provides a set of incentives and uh, compliance measures that, that encourage and force uh, landholders whose land might become uh, conservation land to actually look after that land in the intervening years before it becomes public land. Um, that's just a pretty picture of some 
grassland because it's good to remind people that grassland isn't just grass. It is all of these incredible floral values through there. Now, I think, oh, no, we've got a few more issues that I need to take you through. Um, Biomix, okay? So the point of a strategic assessment is that you take a big picture look at the landscape. It sounds good on paper. We take a big picture of the landscape. We go, we can protect that area. We don't have to protect that area. Um, let's let's create a biolink across it because there's good stuff over there and down there and, and so on. Unfortunately, we have no data on the no data on the quality of the um, landscape, the conservation values around these growth areas. Okay, that data, that surveying has not been done. That data is unavailable. So, City of Geelong talk talk a big talk, as it were, about these opportunity areas becoming biolinks, but we don't know what they're linking. Um, so it's um, very frustrating that the this strategic assessment scale thing is being uh, nobbled, as it were, by lack of good data. So uh, not quite sure what needs to be done there. We need the data. That's what we need, ha has to happen so that we can have a proper discussion about what dot biolinks are doing. There's some other stuff about offsets. So um, the, there's a lot of um, native species and communities that are going to be lost as part of this program. There's uh, like only 100 hectares of 700 hectares of golden sun moth will be protected, for instance. We're going to lose a lot of um, admittedly fairly degraded grassland and so on. Those, the loss of those things has to be compensated for elsewhere. That's what offsetting is. What we want is that offsetting to be really strategic. And by that, I mean the city of Geelong needs to buy the offsets and be clever about what offsets they buy. So offsets within, say, 25 kilometres of the growth areas so that we keep, we protect local nature and uh, choose locations that are next to conservation areas or that are going to be in future conservation corridors and so on. We also want to um, expand what the levy can achieve. So that levy on developers is going to fund uh, the purchase of conservation areas and it's going to fund their ongoing management. What it isn't going to fund is things like this meeting, so the community engagement side of things, building a set of stakeholders who love growling grass frogs and striped legless lizards and whatever, and who might become future um, community protectors of those spaces, I suppose. So um, expand the levy and what it can achieve. There's no um, transparency is another big one. So in these 900 pages of documents that have been released, there is no statement about things. Um, there's no statement about um, any requirements for the city of Geelong to make data public. So um, if, a, there's con if a developer gets a developer plan, that's great, but um, controls the way they do things, but it would be good if we knew that we could see that plan so that we can um, have oversight of this thing. And we also need a whole lot of governance provisions that are not present in these documents either about what happens if things start to go wrong, if the city of Geelong doesn't get its um, purchase its offsets in a timely manner, or if it starts allowing development that really shouldn't be allowed and so on further down the planning process, there needs to be some, some sticks, I suppose. And at the moment, the federal government has a giant stick in that it can say this whole thing isn't working, just stop, and that will put a halt to everything, which would be it's the nuclear option, uh, but we need some things below that that are um, far less nuclear, I suppose. So that needs to be built in. There's a stack of documents. There are five documents that are part of the package of documents that has been the 900 pages that has been released for public comment. Um, public comment continues until 
next Monday, so the 25th, so not much time to go. Uh, there are two high level documents um, that this is the EPBC plan says what's going to be protected and what the goals are. Uh, the strategic assessment report says this is the nature that we're getting, or this is the nature that's present, and this is the impacts we're having on it. And it's the justification for what gets protected in the EPBC plan. And then there's a whole lot of implementation documents. The, the federal minister um, for the environment signs off on these two. Uh, then these ones, they're still uh, are subject to ongoing um, consideration after that, but they're essentially mostly set in stone, but there's wiggle room uh, for, for um, changes as we go through towards the PSP process in um, next year and following years. Now, I think that's pretty much all for me from the moment. That's just who we are, but I've told you that. Um, there's a whole lot of um, resources that I'm going, that are, that are here. You will get an email after this, um, this meeting. I have your email addresses, so I will send you these links in a follow-up email uh, anyway, so don't feel compelled to, to write them down or screenshot them now, but by all means do. And yes, that's it for me for now. So I am going to pass over to the very magnificent David DeAngelis. Um, I better briefly introduce you, I suppose. David, David is a uh, expert in grouting grass rocks and a herpetologist in general. I hope I've got that correct. Uh, he um, work is associated with Latrobe University, does work there, but he also um, is associated with Abzico, the uh, quite the, the consultancy and um, ecological consultancy. He's had a lot of experience uh, across the whole growling grass frog world. Um, yes, I think that's about it. I am going to mute myself. Please share your screen. Oh, I better stop sharing, hadn't I? That could help too. All right, sorry about that, David. Your turn. No worries. All right, see if this works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Adrian, and uh, also for the for the extremely generous promotion to doctor earlier. I'm I'm ashamed to say I haven't followed in your footsteps yet, and gone back to school. Um, but uh, if 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 I happen to, um, may, may not surprise you. It, it'd probably have to be on frogs. Um, but more importantly. Um, most of my knowledge around growling grass frogs has come from the real experts on this species, being mainly Jeff Hurd, who's now been studying a growling grass frog on and off uh, for over 20 years, and initially as part of his PhD, um, and focused on uh, mainly on the Merry Creek catchment, um, and parts of the, the mini ponds and, and the Darabin Creek, so to the north of Melbourne. Um, but uh, nevertheless, most of Jeff's learnings um, are applicable more widely, um, and Geelong obviously is no exception. Um, there are others who I'll mention and, and acknowledge um, and, re and reference who have uh, mostly worked alongside Jeff um, if not in, in other parts of the growling grass frogs range. I, I won't spend too long talking about growling grass frogs per se and get into uh, the, I suppose, given the focus of tonight, the more important aspects of their ecology and uh, life history as it relates to their conservation and um, uh, particularly, particularly, obviously, their occurrence around Geelong. Um, suffice to say, there has been a little bit of a, a taxonomic update relevant to this species um, and to Geelong, being that uh, the growling grass frog as a whole is distributed from southern New South Wales, uh, historically through most of Victoria, 
maybe with exceptions of the the uh, the high high country and the Mallee, uh, but still all the way along the Murray River and into South Australia, and then Tasmania. Um, that's still the case, except there are now two subspecies. So the only real uh, practical relevance that has in terms of its conservation, I suppose, is that it's of even heightened conservation importance uh, um, in each of those entities being subspecies. So we have a northern subspecies, uh, which repeats the specific name of the Grayling grass frog's scientific name. So um, I won't go too or too too uh, into the naming, but it's Latoria raniformis. Raniformis is the northern subspecies, and this southern one now that includes its distribution in Geelong is Latoria raniformis major. So. For um, simplicity, I, I guess, or for ease of explaining uh, the significance of that, um, it really means that these two subspecies, the northern and the southern, are important to manage in their own way as evolutionary important uh, units or populations, if you like. So they, they should be managed for conservation as entities separate uh, from, e from each other, um, rather than uh, the way that we might have considered managing the growling grass frog um, at the, the distribution level in the past, being as, as uh, its species or at the species level. Um, and only otherwise I'll, I'll note at this point that um, as you've sort of touched on, uh, being of mainly federal interest, uh, this strategic assessment, um, it is in, indeed listed federally as vulnerable, but also at the state level under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act, again, as vulnerable. Okay. Um, this is where we get into a, a really interesting uh, conundrum, I guess, in that what we used to think about when we would think about what makes habitat suitable for the growling grass frog has changed over time. And it's in no small part thanks to Jeff Hurd's work, um, but also the work of others. Um, and this is a good example. So when we think about what constitutes good terrestrial or land habitat for the, for, uh, for the growling grass frog, around the wetlands that, that it uh, uses for breeding and uh, they are a mostly aquatic frog. Uh, so granted, they spend most of their, or a lot of their time in the water, but they do most of their foraging on land and they overwinter on land because they're mostly a spring and summer active species. Those are the times of year when it breeds. But, but when it's on land, uh, this was some of the, the very early uh, part of Jeff Hurd's PhD, looking at what microhabitats, what areas around the wetlands and the creeks and river systems where it occurs, does the growling grass frog like most? And maybe, um, what's the word? Non, um, well, it didn't really make sense where Jeff was finding most of the frogs, being that he found most of them on bare ground and on rocks and very low short vegetation, um, rather than denser, uh, arguably more protective vegetation. Um, and you could, uh, well, wondering why that is, it's fair to ask, is that just because the frogs are easier to see when they're in the open on rocks and bare ground. But Jeff accounted for that. So he put a lot more effort into looking in, in the denser vegetation for the frogs. So there's a, a true uh, relationship or correlation there between growling grass frogs and, and rocks and bare ground and very short, low-growing vegetation. 
And the reason, well, the, the uh, hypothesized reason for that, I guess, didn't come until a, a bit later in Jeff's research. Um, and, and it didn't really make sense until then. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. In terms of the aquatic habitat, though, um, what do they like? So this is a, a, a bit simpler, uh, uh, a bit more simple diagram that Jeff came up with uh, to, to neatly illustrate improvement of aquatic habitat. So where, where they're obviously breeding, uh, calling and mating and laying their eggs. And then obviously the tadpoles are stuck in the aquatic habitat until they can complete their development uh, and emerge. And then uh, some of them might remain, but most of them will disperse and move to other, other wetlands. Um, and basically, aquatic or breeding habitat, breeding habitat improves with an increase in submerged vegetation and a little bit of floating vegetation, but not too much because it's important to keep at least some of the, the water surface clear of vegetation. Um, but it's probably not too much of an exaggeration to say that you can almost never have too much submerged vegetation. And there are a few reasons for that. It's where the growling grass frogs lay their eggs. Uh, it's what the tadpoles rely on for their feeding, uh, because they're mostly eating uh, decomposed uh, vegetation under, under the water, uh, but also the uh, biofilms and algae and uh, fungal and, and bacterial uh, sort of scum that grows on the surface of aquatic plants, as well as uh, rocks and, and logs and in the sediment. Um, but, but there's also a, a reason that didn't become um, as apparent until later uh, as to why it's important to keep at, at least a good part of the water surface clear. Submerged plants don't block any sunlight from getting in, or not much anyway, from, from penetrating the water column. But taller vegetation around the edge of the wetland and floating vegetation obviously can block out a lot more sunlight. And we now uh, have a better idea of why it's important for these wetlands and, and creek systems, waterways, where the grayling grass frog occurs, um, why it's important to keep a lot of that uh, water surface exposed to the sun. Okay, before I get on to that, though, and finally reveal the reason, um, important to mention that grayling grass frogs, like most frogs, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, don't really care what the vegetation is, so far as what the species of plants are, where, where they're um, occurring or in the habitat that they're using. As long as the vegetation provides a suitable structure. So we might care when we're talking about land care and uh, spending money on revegetation and uh, for want of a better word, depending on your preference, rehabilitation of wetlands and when we're creating wetlands for uh, species like this. Um, obviously, the preference is to maintain and enhance Indigenous vegetation. But it's fair to say that the frogs don't mind themselves. Um, you know, we're obviously caring about the broader biodiversity and ecology in these systems, not just the frogs. Um, this is a, a neat example, I thought, of a growling grass frog uh, on an agapanthus. Not that we want to be promoting uh, the planting of agapanthus uh, in, in, well, any area, uh, in some of our opinions. Uh, but uh, interestingly, where this photo was taken in New Zealand, the growling grass frog is also an introduced species. Um, and they're doing very well there, uh, which, which is interesting when you consider how grayling grass frogs have contracted in their range where they're meant to be occurring in southeastern Australia. 
So uh, to give you some idea of that, uh, these are records from the Atlas of Living Australia, but predating um, or the, the mid 2000s, I suppose, uh, and from the early 90s. And if we go to the, the decade or so after that, what we see is that uh, the records have contracted. So they're still occurring in the uh, regions where you would expect, uh, but in a lot less area or over a lot, lot less uh, space geographically. Um, and so we now have the northern, what's become the northern subspecies restricted, uh, largely restricted to the Murray uh, River floodplain. Um, and the southern subspecies with hotspots or concentrations to the southeast of Melbourne, so around Cooey Rup and uh, sort of uh, Lang Lang and, and Western Port area. Um, and then to the west, and the north of Melbourne uh, and the volcanic plain. Um, so they, they follow the Victorian volcanic plain through uh, to uh, uh, eastern or uh, southeast South Australia. And that remains the case uh, to this day. Um, but the reason for that uh, contraction, uh, it was discovered fairly early on or suspected uh, that it was a pathogen, so the amphibian chytrid fungus. Um, and I, I won't uh, spend too much time explaining what, what it is or what it does. Uh, suffice to say that um, it's a nasty disease for the frogs that suffer from it, and many species do, uh, because it attacks their skin. Um, it feeds on keratin, which is what frog skin is, is mainly composed of. Um, so, um, I mean, skin is an important uh, organ or component of any animal, but particularly for amphibians, uh, because they use their skin not just to prevent infection and to remain hydrated in a similar way that we do, uh, but for example, they breathe through their skin. They still have lungs, but a percentage of their oxygen intake is through their skin, but it's also permeable and, and uh, can be permeable um, to pollutants in some cases, but it's still an effective barrier. Um, obviously, uh, with a disease like this uh, that attacks the skin, it leaves them vulnerable to secondary infections and to pollutants and, and, uh, and other things. Uh, okay. um, and later on in Jeff's studies, he made a really, uh, well, what I think is a remarkable discovery um, in terms of chytrid fungus and how it uh, interacts with the frogs or their populations in a, a wetland or a, a waterway. And he found that um, there may uh, be a, uh, an explanation as to why the grayling grass frogs contracted to some of the areas where it's been able to survive and, and still exists today. And it has to do with um, environmental factors like temperature. So this gets back to the importance of vegetation around a wetland uh, for grayling grass frogs. Because what he discovered is in wetlands, or waterways that are, are uh, naturally or otherwise warmer than others, those wetlands and waterways are better for the grayling grass frog because they are less suitable for the amphibian chytrid fungus. And that's because the chytrid fungus dies off uh, when the temperature reaches high 20s uh, and then into the 30s, it, it dies off completely. Um, so it doesn't do too well at around 25 degrees um, and as you're, you're approaching those temperatures in the high 20s. Um, but he also found that salt, higher salinity, inhibits chytrid fungus. And so a lot of the wetlands where growling grass frogs exist now, and particularly on the volcanic plain, 
but also some of those catchments to the north of Melbourne, and often where you find grayling grass frogs in proximity to the coast are more highly saline than some of the areas where the grayling grass frog used to occur and doesn't occur any longer. So salt being or having fungicidal properties is also effective or acts against chytrid fungus. And at certain levels, the grayling grass frogs are able to tolerate elevated levels of salt uh, that, it, that inhibit the growth of the fungus. Um, so chemistry went over my head at uni, but uh, until it became relevant to frogs. But uh, uh, to give you some idea, uh, ball water that, that you know farmers might provide to um, at, at least dry sheep, or uh, to us, it, it would taste salty. Uh, so around three uh, three thousand EC or whatever that converts to to, to ppm is um, tolerable for the frogs, but not so much for the fungus. So these explain perhaps a little bit about where we find growling grass frogs now, but also about what uh, wetlands or areas when we're talking about the aquatic habitat pro uh, might provide suitable habitat for the frog into the future. So not to suggest that we should be denuding and uh, tipping salt into all the wetlands, but uh, for the growling grass frog at least, um, they're becoming important considerations. Um, and this otherwise very complicated conceptual diagram that Jeff comes up uh, came up with uh, very simply explains that relationship so that with increasing riparian tree cover and shrub cover, woody, overshading vegetation, uh, it lowers the water temperature and decreases the suitability of these habitats for the growling grass frog, uh, but improves the situation for the chytrid fungus, which obviously has a negative impact on the ability of the grayling grass frog to survive. So this has very much changed or, or is changing our way of thinking about what uh, provides a suitable wetland or waterway habitat for the grayling grass frog. So rather than cool sheltered uh, a, a wetland or waterway systems, um, Melbourne Water, for example, now puts emphasis on growling on ideal habitat for the growling grass frog being more open and sunny um, and allowing the sun in along the banks and into the water um, and maybe even for example using bore water to fill new wetlands that are being created for the growling grass frog to get that potential protection from the elevated salinity Okay, and very quickly, uh, an example of an area like this uh, in the Shangri-La, that is Craig, uh, not, uh, Craigieburn, Lake Caroline, Caroline Springs. So when that suburb was created, um, they, of course, as they do in these urban precincts, create water features often. Um, and in this case, the water feature that they created rather than being an environmental um, impost or detracting from the ecology of the area, uh, was colonised by grayling grass frogs. Granted, there is connectivity in this case with a nearby creek where the frog uh, uh, remains reasonably common, the Corroy Creek. Um, but the lake itself uh, you wouldn't think would provide good habitat for an endangered frog, uh, but it is more, more uh, saline than you would expect uh, to be the case in a natural lake system in this part of the world. Uh, and it's uh, probably sunnier and warmer uh, than you might expect for a, a natural, a more natural wetland uh, in this part of the world. So, uh, in fact, you get growling grass frogs perching on the concrete ledge under the Mercure Hotel, 
uh, and going into uh, the gardens of the residential units uh, are, are under the dietes and the uh, horrible introduced uh, plants that, that people have put in their gardens because it's still sunny and open and uh, provides all of the opportunities that the grayling grass for looks for in terms of its foraging. Um, and there is some cover, rocks, uh, the uh, gabion walls around the edge of the lake um, and, and reeds and rushes where the frogs can shelter um, and the emergent aquatic vegetation. And there is a little bit of submergent vegetation that provide breeding opportunities for the frog as well. Okay, I won't spend too much time on this uh, as well, given that uh, Adrian's recording it for us, um, but uh, just some, some summary points in terms of what people should be thinking about when these sorts of areas are being surveyed for the grayling grass frog to maximise our likelihood of detecting it. Uh, so particularly uh, of relevance for citizen scientists and uh, interested community groups that might want to look for additional locations where the grayling grass frog might turn up. These are important considerations. Uh, so for example, uh, they do like uh, warmer temperatures for their activity as well. So for that reason, surveying for them when the temperature is no longer than 12 degrees, but they are nocturnal when, when they're active. Mainly, they, are, they do also come out during the day occasionally, and, and they'll even bask in the sun. But for the most part, we can most easily see and hear them at night. Um, so I, I, as I say, I, I won't spend too much more time on this, except maybe that last point to say that uh, now with the advent and increasing use of remote acoustic, acoustic recorders, recorders uh, those audio devices are, are becoming an increasingly handy method, uh, particularly in areas that you might not be able to access uh, conveniently uh, in person uh, or on foot. So uh, particularly ones that have a, a reasonably long range, like the song meters um, uh, and things like audio moss. Okay, um, and this is just to summarise most of what I've covered uh, already. So again, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, but there are some particularly uh, important points there as well that Adrian referred to in terms of buffer distances. Uh, so we know from research that others have undertaken uh, for what's now considered the northern subspecies, but presumably applies to the southern subspecies around Geelong in terms of how far they might wander away from the water. Uh, so that 200 metre uh, reference uh, for an, uh, maybe a more ideal buffer for this species um, is uh, assumed to come from this research that was undertaken in southern New South Wales that found that within a 24-hour um, period, um, it may not be so uncommon to get railing grass rogues hopping as far as 200 metres uh, from its uh, waterway or water body where they're breeding. Um, but they can go much further than that. And so, in fact, uh, when they're dispersing, particularly at the juvenile stage, um, connectivity in the landscape more broadly becomes important. Um, so um, moving between water bodies or between uh, catchments uh, as far as kilometres potentially uh, can, can come into play. Um, but when we're talking about a, a wetland system uh, in isolation or, uh, for example, Cowie's, uh, Cowie's Creek or the Moorabool River, um, that 200 metre distance is probably a, a better a buffer based on what the frogs are using on a, uh, a daily or, or uh, weekly or, or more 
regular basis. Um, and the point that given that the frogs don't necessarily care what the plant species are, um, it's of relevance when we're considering the places where we suspect the frogs could occur. Uh, because previously or historically, uh, a consultant like myself might have said, well, if you have a wetland or uh, a uh, waterway that's dominated by introduced weeds uh, and things like kakuyu uh, and sweet vernal grass and, um, you know, even some noxious weed species, that it might not provide habitat for an endangered species like the growling grass frog. But we now know, and there are numerous examples where that's just not uh, the case. So growling grass frogs, uh, we, we now recognise, can survive in agricultural landscapes and on fairly even heavily disturbed uh, uh, situations, including uh, farm dams, uh, that otherwise experience pugging and all these environmental impacts that are undesirable from a, an ecological perspective. But the growling grass frogs still have potential to uh, not only persist and survive, but uh, uh, occasionally thrive in those sort of otherwise disturbed habitats. Um, and the reasons being that they meet their minimum, minimum requirements. Um, so they're often open and warm, um, and they may well be saline, uh, enough to inhibit that chytrid fungus, but luckily for the growling grass frog, they can tolerate that level of disturbance. Okay. And I might leave it there, I, I reckon. Yeah, those are... Uh, uh, some of the, the works and references that I've um, been talking about. Yeah, that might be of uh, relevance when people are writing their submissions.
Yeah. Just while I'm messing around with my computer, can you tell people about um, something interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Well, there there is something very interesting that I spoke with you about, Adrian, that I I suppose we can mention at this point, and that's the last point that you focused on. So there there are uh, several, well, a few species that haven't been considered at all so far in the strategic ass assessment and aren't likely to, and, and they may not be um, unless they are raised as issues at this point. And even then, I wonder how, how seriously they'll be taken. Um, there may be ones on the flora side. I, I just saw Pymelia spinescens, the spiny rice flower. That's obviously a federally listed uh, matter as well. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I can't speak to that because I, I well, not really, because I am more on the zoology side of things but uh suffice to say on the zoology side there are uh, three lizard species uh, that haven't been considered thus far um one uh, mind you one of them is only listed under the st uh, at the state level under the flora and fauna guarantee act being the tussock skink but it would occupy the same habitat and uh, even more degraded grassland, more broadly than the striped legless lizard. Um, and we'd absolutely expect that that species would be present in those uh, assessment areas. Uh, the other two are the swamp skink, and that species has just been listed as endangered under the EPBC Act. And it's known from the Ballerine Peninsula. Um, and it, it may be present in these areas, nobody knows, because it won't have been surveyed for in these areas before. Um, um, yeah, so anyway, I'll yeah. stop there for now. And Thank then, yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. Uh, sorry, very apology, apologies, everyone. So my computer seems to be working again better now. So yes, as David was saying, very important that um, there could be other surveys that should happen, and we should make that point in our submissions. Uh, this is just a quick case study of um, like how people's voices can be heard. So this is from the VMPA. They they um, ran a campaign about development in alpine areas um, last year. They they did a whole lot of stuff like what we're doing, having community consultation and so on. What was nice was that all of these people like did um, did stuff. And a whole lot of people were informed about stuff. And then all of these quotes, people started doing their submissions and all of these quotes came in. And often they were, um, they put things in a way that the VNPA hadn't thought of it or they'd make, made lines of argument that hadn't been made before. So they expanded the discussion and they made the discussion more personal and powerful. So um, there are some nice quotes. I won't, where it's sort of, bit tight on time at the moment, so I'm just going to skip through it. But it's um, important to know that it can be done and that we can do it. Um, and it's only people like us, us who ever do make change. So in your submission writing, most importantly, introduce yourself. So make sure it's very clear if you have any credentials, if you're a resident, if you're a long time resident, if you're um, have got a background in science or or whatever, if you're a wildlife enthusiast, uh, be very clear about what is important to you, what issues you are making comment. You do not have to comment on everything in um, a submission. You can just choose one thing and do it well, and that is fine. If you think it's um, giving more room to growling grass frogs or if you think it's protecting grasslands or if you think the mighty Murabal needs to be back to its mighty self again, whatever. These are all very valid and important things and it's just fine to focus precisely on something like that. Um, and if you can, use evidence to, to back things up. You don't have to go into the level of scientific evidence that David has unless you're David. 
and when he puts in his submission, we expect him to, to put in a crackingly detailed one, but um, just to, to the extent of your best knowledge, I suppose. Uh, and yes, important, just go forth and, and use your power. All right, so that's all, all my slides and talking. Let's go back 